So, uh, so now I'll explain, you see, I'm starting to explain two things. And Don would ask me questions every time when, I, when it is unclear to him. And this is the rule, right? Because it's called discussion with Don. And we should go according to the title. So I will try to explain how vertex algebras are. So maybe you, you can stop recording. Are coming out of higher topological quantum field theory. And I will say it in examples so it was it was it was the first question and of course there was a second question and second question is also very interesting it's about how to call it sorry andre i think you are out of focus Ah, okay. So I know this problem. Thank you very much. So let me see. Uh, there is one way to make the focus back is to reload video. Okay, now it's much, much better. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anytime when you have problem with sound or video, please let me know immediately. Okay. So here is Floyer Fukaya theory. And let me pull it, put it again. Only shook. Only. I, I also get how to to write it. Poly Shook vertex algebra. I actually wanted the. Uh, I actually wanted uh, to say some about some correlators, but now I realize that it's better to advertise it as a Poly Shook vertex algebra. So let me announce the statement here that it's possible to go from holomorphic maps to a vertex algebra where on it would be something like moduli space of the of moduli space of d brains I will call it Polishuk free fermion. Okay, Polishuk chiral speed. And when I say Polishuk chiral field, field, you see it, it, it sounds like words. Let me write down the formula. Formula is very simple. This guy that you know from vertex algebra solves the A infinity relation for three to one operation. Do you know this? Do you mean uh, the one over z minus omega? Yes. So, yeah, I, I know what it is, but I don't think that's what you meant. No, you you know one over z minus w. Oh yes, of course. And okay. everybody knows the following formula: z minus w, w minus u. Okay, I'll I'll put it in the cyclic way: one over z one minus z two. 
Z2 minus Z3 plus plus equals to zero. Do you know this formula? You can just uh, make computation and you will see that it is true. However, what is remarkable is that this formula has the following interpretation as uh, a infinity structure. Okay. That's that sounds very interesting. You see, I need to show the aim where I'm going. So all this is to finally explain this. And let me tell you about this structure. So mostly people are interested when people are talking about a infinity, they mostly study this equation M2. And they used to say that associativity, okay, this minus one, two, three, one, two, three. That it equals to Q of this. Okay. So when people think about the infinity, they think about this type of relations. Actually, this Q could also be written in pictures. You just have here a unitary operation. Okay, plus pictures of this type. So this is how people used to say a infinity. You multiply, you multiply, you have a non-associative product. However, it is corrected by M1 and people call M1 differential. Okay, don't. You know this. However, why should we start with two to one? Well, it's much better. What would happen if we will start with three to one? Then we come to the graphic interpretation of uh, A infinity. So really in A infinity, a infinity is a collection of operations. Okay, I'll write this. It's how it appeared in the literature. By the way, it appeared in the literature uh, in the discussion between Kolmogorov from Russia and I think Milner on the international conference. When they were trying to define uh, the product on co-cycles. And it turns out that it's impossible to define the product on Casa. So don't you know this? So I'll not go into the history. So uh, there were two operations of a product. One was associative and not commutative. And another was commutative, but not associative. And the problem uh, of having commutative or actually super commutative operation was solved by higher operation. It was in the 60s, a long time ago. Since then, people developed the notion of A infinity and uh, and they understand it is, it is as follows. You have a ribbon graph, okay? You have operations like MI and MJ, and you sum over all possible I's and J's. 
and with sign. And that should give zero. So for people from homological algebra, it is equivalent to say, do you know this? That free non commutative vector field is homological. Don, do you know this interpretation? No. You are very educated, yes. So you know this. Okay? I Good. think it's from Antevich, but it, you're saying that it was actually from Milner? No. Everything started in the 60s. The first idea to correct uh, associativity, to correct associativity by higher operation appeared in the 60s in the discussion between Milner and the Kalmagor. Oh, that is very interesting. It's so it was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you know how to multiply differential forms, but you would like to know how to, they were thinking about, how to put topology on the cellular, on the cellular, cellular complex, okay? So then you don't have differential forms, you have cosines. Then the question was how to multiply cosines. And Milner provided the formula with the associative multiplication of cosines. So it's called one of the Barker, it's what's called Barker destruction. But it was not super commutative. So it was not like differential. Kalmar Gorov proposed a formula that was super commutative. But Milner pointed out that it's not associative. So then, at least it was a puzzle, and I actually don't remember, don't know who came with an answer. That you need to say that, you see, uh, that for cycles uh, you have non-associativity, however, this non-associativity was exact. And the idea is to take out differential that is well defined on cycles. And it was this, and later on, Milner introduced the theory of integration, maybe you know it, of differential forms that led to this A infinity stuff on the cycles. And we, with Pavel Nov, Pavel Nov actually, were using it in constructing of infinity structures in some cases, okay? So the, uh, that's why I know it also. So now let us see the following particular case. So when you have only M3, no differentials, no binary operation, okay? Something that is very far from being differential forms. You actually have only this type of structure. One, two, three, four, five into six. Okay. So then you can rearrange things a bit, as far as I remember. So you, you can have this, and you can also regroup terms. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, and you can also have uh, uh, other types. So uh, let me, so there, there should be three types. So the way how I remember these types is of course not writing these operations, okay? But by writing a disk, Here is six, and here I have one, two, three, four, five. So six points on the disk. It's exactly Fukaya theory. And then you can degenerate. 
And there are several ways how you can group it. So this is an output. It's marked. How you can degenerate. Cutting here. Cutting here or cutting here. Three ways. OK. So let me see from the disk how it goes on here. So uh, here I wrote this cutting. One, two, three, four, five, six. However, would I cut it like this? I will get yes, I see. Three, four, five. Go to one, two, six. And there was another diagram. Of course, these diagrams are just the generation of this disk. Okay. But this is a picture. So let us see what's going on here. This thing is an operation. However, it's tricky. That operation depends on parameters. Okay. And uh, how can one find the operation depending on parameters that solve this equation? The lucky guess is that this is so that this depends on three parameters and uh, on two parameters. And totally, you have three parameters. And uh, these parameters are basically positions of the brains. And you associate here you put Z one, one, two, three, four. Okay, so actually, here there are. One, two, three, four components. So you put to this component Z1, Z2, and you put here something that I'll call L. And at the moment, don't think what this L is. You have Z1 and Z2. Okay. And you may compute, and it, uh, it turns out. That it is one over z1 minus z2. And here is this exactly this beautiful relation that proves that this is a good uh, explanation of an operation. So let me ask Don Do you know what this z1 and L mean in? Uh, a and B models. Okay, for uh, so I have no idea what Z, what the variable Z would be, but this L should be uh, the grandness of manifold in A model and yeah. C and B models. models. And what? So l let me give you an answer. You see? You see? Uh, it's better to start long discussion by knowing what can we see. So I actually simplified the Polishuk derivation. Polishuk was studying the torus, and later on he studied driven surfaces. But you know. Actually, I prefer simplicity. Simplicity means that if there is a phenomena, you should explain it in the simplest possible case. Okay? And then you may think how to go to higher uh, generalizations. So consider C star. Huh? 
Good? It's an infinite cylinder. And then we will consider covering, coverings on C-star. But not all coverings. We will put or take four Lagrangian submanifolds. Two Lagrangian submanifolds of this type of, uh, I call them horizontal, and two Lagrangian submanifolds of this type. I will call them vertical, okay? And I have a holomorphic map of a disk to the cylinder that is bounded by these four Lagrangian submanifolds, right? So the question is, how many maps do you see? It's clearly that there is at least one map. Okay. But from one map, you will never get this interesting formula. One map would be if there is a theory of the plane. And then I don't think that you'll get nice relations. Maybe you will get. Maybe it's possible even to simplify this. But I prefer this C star. You know, I prefer this C star because I have a circle. And if I have a circle, it would be possible for me to see the mirror phenomena. Because mirror is related to a circle. Okay, maybe it's a good starting point, yes? You will hear something interesting before we start general discussion. Okay, what does this thing mean? We should take this guy and uh, consider it weighted by its area. So here we have, you see, Z are complex. And here we have Y1, Y2. And let this circumference be equal to 1. Okay. So what is the area here? Times one. At the moment, this has nothing to do with this. This is exponential, yes? And here we have something like a pole. Okay. So when we see a pole, it means that something blows up, okay? Nothing blows up here. Now I'll show you what actually blows up. You need to see another covering here. Don, do you, can you see another covering? That bounds on this four Lagrangian submanifold. What do you mean by bound this Lagrangian submanifold? So, so there are vertical submanifolds. L, L, L1, L2. And they, these are horizontal. So yes. let me show you another covering that is bounded by these submanifolds. I will go all the way around and end here. Okay? You need to imagine this. So this has a one-dimensional analog. You can have this thing. But you can also have this. Okay? And you can go Again, hmm? so here we have these coverings. Ah, I made a wrong statement. Here is y1 minus y2, but 
the area of this is not one. Here we have phi one minus phi two. Sorry, nobody corrected me. I made a mistake. I thought you somehow normalized everything. No, 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 no. These have position. The area depends on these positions. And of course, symplectic form is the standard one. Okay? D phi, D y. Okay? So this is the area. Now we have these coverings. So the contribution for each covering goes like, ah, you see, y1 minus y2 times 1 times this factor. Okay, I'll arrange this, this. And I have a sum. And I have this thing in front. Sum from n equals from two, from zero to infinity. And it's better to put a minus here for sum to converge. So can you sum it? Of course, it's a geometrical progression. Okay. That's how we call it in Russia. I, for, I forget the English name. So we can sum it. Times one, okay? Now we can see the pole, okay? Now we see the pole that comes when y1 comes to y2. Because area factor that suppresses covering goes to zero and everything blows up. Hmm? So this is the origin of the poem. Very geometric. The poem no has quantum been. field theory. Pure uh, uh, floyer Fukaya. Okay. No physics. You see the blow up. Okay. However, these wise seem to be real. The question would be, is it possible to make them complex? And of, uh, the answer is, of course, yes, because uh, what you can do, you can put the local system, okay? So what is local system? Local system is basically any connection in the line bundle. Actually, yeah. you could have a connection in vector bundles, but uh, in this simple case, uh, it is the same. So where can you put it? You can put it here, because it's this connection that would be important. Connection here would not be that important, because uh, it enters into this factor, into three factor. However, connection here would be important. So here you put connection A2, A1, and uh, every time you are wrapping, you are multiplying not only with this one, but also 
with the monodromies. And monodromies are basically A1 minus A2 times N. When you are wrapping your integral of this connection is also multiplied by M, okay? So, so this come out here. So actually you have not Y1, y but Y1 minus A, A1 minus Now, I am almost done. Let me consider this thing. Let me just call it Z1. And let me call, of course, this thing Z2, okay? No problem here. Then this area is one minus Z1 over Z2 and something here. So you see this, Paul? You could go to other coordinates, but you see this pole and you can degenerate it in that relation. So this is called trigonometric relation and the relation that I wrote here was, uh, okay rational. So you can write similar formula. I'm just explaining the idea. So you mean that if you choose a right curve on, say, on the Riemann surface, so that every, every kind of sectors that you have is, uh, looks like a square, then you will have the same kind of relation. Is that what you're saying? Oh, so if if it's a disk, so how I am parameterizing the disk? I have vertical Lagrangians and I have horizontal Lagrangians. So these are L1, L2, or let me recall them vertical. And these are horizontal. Okay. H1, H2. And you have a disk. And you are starting vertical one, horizontal one, vertical two, horizontal two. And you study this type of holomorphic maps, holomorphic disks. Everything is explicit. It's interesting that you don't need even to think that here you integrate of a moduli space of points on the boundary. It's, a, it's already a result. And here we have this thing with a pole. Okay. And here you have some grains. And you interpret this pole as a blow up in this, uh, because you don't have exponential suppression factor. And this is one way to think, Foucault. And you may prove directly or by inspecting differential forms on the moduli space that you have this quadratic relation. However, there is another way to get it. Let us make a mirror transformation. With respect to this circle, what would you get? The Grangian brains would go into sheaves. Okay.
And there is a rule that all physicists know that the brain that wraps become a brain that is placed. And if the brain that is not wrapping wraps. So here is the cycle as well. Now we are going to the dual cycle. For the dual cycle, this brain was wrapping. So H1 comes to the point. The same happens with H2. So these verticals were not wrapped. So they became wrapped on uh, the dual cycle. So now I'll have a hard time to draw things. It is easy to draw H1 and H2 because it's easy to draw the points. However, it's harder to draw the wrapping. I'll try to draw them in blue. L1 is here and L2 is here. So now, how do we interpret a, uh, sorry, V? So how do we interpret Vs that now have support on the total space? Of course, these are line bundles, okay? So I have line bundle V1, line bundle V2. So what are these H1 and H2? Of course, they are skyscraper shapes. So from the mirror point of view, these Vs would become line, band, line bundles. And these guys would become, how we call it, O Z1 and O Z2. Good. So what happens with these points? Previously, they were just points of intersection. So of course, they become axes. And you can check that there is only one X from O to L and from L to O. Okay. So one X is just home. As far as I remember, if I go from line bundle to skyscraper, this home is just evaluation at point Z1. However, when I go from O to L, I have the higher X. Okay, so I understand this. Now, what can I say about this? picture. I would say, come on, what kind of a disk? What I'm talking about? It's a homological problem. It's a Massey operation. Okay. Right. On these guys. So how can I draw it? Okay, my drawing is not very nice, but, but here I have X, here I have X, here I have X. So actually X are cohomology of the space called R home. Okay. And it is actually a very crazy notation. Do you know why this is called dark hole? Because it is a right, right, right bumper of a. Huh? 
Uh, you see, you might call it this way, but I would prefer another thing. And uh, so I would prefer to call it home dot. Because uh, when people started uh, studying complexes, they defined the home of complexes, the closed map. However, would they, would they think a bit? They would, uh, they should call all homes between vector spaces, homes of complexes. Yes. And then they will naturally, naturally inherit the adjoint action of differential. But when people start to do something, they, you see, it's very general thing. Anytime you have a complex and you have another complex, you have a linear map with the action of, uh, with the adjoint action of differential. You do not need to think about resolvance or anything. It's very general thing. You see, that's why I don't like this R dot. Actually, I don't like it <laughs> either. Okay, <laughs> because it's a natural construction. You see, some complexes come from resolvent. That's how they originally appear. But after people start to work with them, they see that it's just complexes. And when you talk about resolvent, the thing you need actually is a kind of convergence that uh, they could be infinite dimensional, dimensional in both directions. When you compute something, sometimes you have a series and not a polynomial. So that's why you get this Z grading. You know, I am Russian. And there are several differences between the Russians and French people, okay? And, uh, and the difference is that Russians prefer Z2 grading because Russians were uh, thinking about super geometry generation created by uh, Grassmann, who was again a French person. So Grassmann in the 19th century created super geometry, nobody understood him, okay? Later on in the 50s, French mathematical school created complexes as resolvents or resolutions to some object. In parallel, in, not at parallel, in 60s, there was a Russian mathematician, Berezin, who moved uh, to, uh, the idea of Grassmann, created super geometry. So in super geometry, the only thing you care about is either you are even or odd. So you have natural Z2 grading. However, when you are doing resolvents, you naturally have Z grading. So that, so starting from this place, there is a constant conflict between schools. So that's why some followers of Russian notation prefer this letter pi. That is a shift of the two grading by one. People who follow the French tradition so PV, prefer to write V shifted by one. So when you see this notation, you may be sure that you are working with the French person. If you have this, you should be sure that you are working with somebody from Russian school. However, there is an important thing that were missed by both schools. Okay, let me say something about it. Dong, are you following me? Oh yes, yes. Actually, I I am used to use both. <laughs> ah, so you know both. And but if you ask me, I would prefer the later one. This one. 
it's so in the sense I'm following. Okay, that. so uh, okay, Russian notation fails, no problem, but uh, Russian ideas are still there. They are not actually Russian, but we'll come to this in a moment. Uh, I think you don't mind if you talk a, a bit about homological algebra, okay? But in this case, you, you can uh, make it a little bit faster. I can go faster? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, there is something that uh, joins ideas of Russian and French school. And this is a notion of humanity. So Russians understand supermanifold. Okay. And uh, so here we have super coordinates, but no differential. French school understands the idea of the complex. So you have differential, but everything is linear. If you join this idea together, you will get the idea of Q-manifold, okay? So it is Russian French friendship, okay? So when you have Q-manifold and Q is the homological vector field, okay? Then to get these operations, you need to do what? You need to come to it zero and consider the formal power series, okay? Okay? So to do this, you need to pick up coordinates. However, everybody knows that uh, homological vector field is defined up to what? Up to diffeomorphism, okay? So since you know non-commutative, you know this, okay? And, uh, but this idea is natural only from the Russian point of view. When you have, when it's treated as a vector field, not written down in coordinates. So that's why formulas about M that I wrote are of course written in coordinates. And you can go from one set of M to another set of M. That is equivalent. So when you write this thing this way, you write in fixed coordinates. When you make diffeomorphism, you are somehow doing uh, general relativity in linear algebra, okay? So if you join this idea, you understand what's going on. Okay, so it was about Q-manifold. And uh, it was about what this was why I prefer this notation and Z2 grading. So when you do this, actually, when you do this diffeomorphism, you are changing uh, Z degrees. Okay. So it's a it's question how you treat the formal vector field with coordinates or without coordinates. Okay. Okay, now let me come to this point. So once again, you have this Z1, Z2, and uh, say two line bundles, you have this X. So you have this Massey operation, okay? Okay, let me then ask questions. Do you know why this Massey operation has a pool when Z1 goes to Z2? Uh, because if they are, if Z1 is different from Z2, then there are no homomorphism from here to there. But exactly. if they collide, then the extension group becomes yes. non-trivial. Yes, yes. So it's just not defined. Well, good. You see. So here I can go faster. Okay. So it is the origin of the pool. Okay. So. So we, so here we predict a pole, 
But the question is, how do we know that this is one over z1 minus z2 and not one over z1 minus z2 square? Hmm? Maybe here I'll, I'll tell you something. So you know that it, that it has kind of a pole. So everything is uh, holomorphic. So you can check that it should be meromorphic function. The question is, why the pole of, of, is of the first order? Hmm? Hmm. Of course, there is an answer in Polishuk uh, paper. Okay. Uh... Very old Polishuk, like end of the last century. Okay. Uh, first, I have to admit that I don't have a right intuition for the operation that has a Paul means. So maybe you could explain that one first. So why operation has a pole? It is not defined on diagonal. Ah. Okay. From the point of view of shifts. But, but, but Paul has an order, and I don't have an intuition of that one. So. Ah, and I, and I will give you intuition, you see. Okay. I told you, I am here to give you intuition, right? Yes. So it's my task. I want to pass to you not the formulas with the rational functions or trigonometric functions. Mm -hmm. I am here to pass you the intuition. Intuition is how to know in advance that you should get this pole mm -hmm. of the first order. And intuition, let me give you a hint. This hint comes from another simple formula. You see, I am not writing complicated formulas. I am not writing a complicated uh, picture. I am not talking in full generality. I'm trying to explain what one could expect. Okay. Let me give you a hint and then you will guess. Okay. The hint is d bar one over z one minus z two is do you know what? D bar and Z1. R and Z1, okay. Uh. It's a delta function. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, yes, yes, right. Huh? Yes, delta so function yes. Uh, supported on the diagonal, right? Supported on the diagonal. Of course, but, mm, yes. but many things could be supported on diagonal. Mm -hmm. But exactly this is a delta function. And this is Cauchy's theorem. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if you interpret Cauchy's theorem in terms of Dalbo operator, Cauchy is very old Cauchy. Okay. Cauchy says this equals f of z2. Here are some pies. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How right, do we yeah. interpret it? This is holomorphic, okay? Would this be holomorphic? The result would be zero because this d bar could be made the total d. We already have dz, okay? So we can use uh, Stokes theory, but it seems as this is not holomorphic. 
on diagonal. And the e equals exactly f of z t. That's why it's a delta function. OK, I see, I see. Then I'm following. Yeah. OK, so, we, so if you know this marvelous fact, then you can guess why there is a pole of the first order. OK, so I'll give you hints one after another. And I'll wait until you will uh, guess the result. Is it related to the dimension of the extension? Here, here it's, uh, it's a good point because all of this could be done in higher dimensions. It's a very interesting question, but it is generalization. Mm -hmm. Now the question is how to, the question is what is Massey operation? What do we put here? The propagator? Propagator comes from physics. Mm -hmm. OK, so it's so some sort of, mode. yeah, yes. Yeah. The kernels of a delta functions, right? It's you sort put of like... here homotopy. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, homotopy. Right? Come on. Propagators are physics. <laughs> here homotopy. homotopy. Ah. So yeah. then? Here is something, here is something, and here we have homotopy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you might try to guess homotopy for what? So homotopy for homotopy for differentials, D bar. Yes. Then you need to guess which type of what type of differentials we are using. Of course, del bar. Good. Then how can we get del bar here. So now you know everything. You need to make a last guess. So why? So homotopy, gamma. Mm -hmm. So this, this, so what's written here, of course, is the statement that this is homotopy. Mm, right, yes. This thing inverts del bar. Where is it invertible? So it's actually homotopy. Then the question is, how the hell del bar appears here? Here it's algebraic geometry. How, how are you doing uh, uh, this X computations? You are replacing the shift. Global resolution. What? For any shift, you have a double resolution, so. Right, so you, so you guessed it, okay? Yes, in order to do this, you need to use double resolution. And what happens if you use another resolution? You just make a double complex. And making this double complex, you can check that result is the same. By the way, it applies what's interesting that when you are changing resolutions, the type of diagram could change. But uh, so now you see that there is Dalbo resolutions. So now you are dealing with the strange world of D bar something. So now your differential is del bore, if you want to see it in this way. Okay, so now you, you are in the world of smooth functions with the bar there. And that's how you are coming to so-called chiral theory and vertex operators. So now you see that you are coming to the complex where the bar acting on something. And this the bar is of course the bar on these spaces of these. So, so what I call Polishuk fermion or Polishuk field, okay? Polishuk was not calling it that way because uh, he wrote it. So 
the way to write X in terms of Dalbo resolution. Okay. So you write X in terms of Dalbo resolution. Actually, the fermions, uh, I think maybe it's not X, but composition of X. I don't remember right now. And here there are two line bundles. So this fermion, of course, takes values not in functions. It takes values in maps between two line bundles. Okay, so this is the simplest example of higher mirror. And here we have a relation between Fukaya here and uh, so this is typically definitely A. This is definitely B. I somehow mapped one to another. But when you have this uh, D-bar fermion, okay, you understand that this fermion is a element from the vertex algebra. So that's how vertex algebras are coming to the kit. Okay. Okay, then I need to understand more because that sounds really- Of course, of course. You see, I tried. I, I try, I'm trying to adjust to your speed, okay? So please control me. Moreover, what is also known about so-called mirror is that wrappings go to so-called momenta, okay? So what momenta means? Momenta basically mean that uh, that you have a field and you expand this field in terms of of exponentials. So you have a function on a circle and you can expand. Mm -hmm. By the way, it was exactly procedure that I was done uh, yesterday. In the so-called so mirror thing, so you're getting exponential fields from yes, the... yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I re I'm replacing uh, the wrappings by exponential fields. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, there is a rule that we should have breaks sometime. Okay, so maybe, so how long have I talked? So I you talked said, for uh, one hour and uh, 10 minutes. So if you wish, let us do the following. I don't know your plans, but we can have an eight minutes break and then I'll talk for, 30 minutes more and they'll explain the general idea how vertex operators are coming from quantum field theories in the way suitable for mathematicians. You see, I think that what I explained is understandable for mathematicians. It is understandable. Actually, I, I have seen this already. Uh, it was a joint work, I think, Polishuk and Yankee the Kitty, which is a blur theory. The mathematicians who do blur theory, the the similar formulas appear in their paper, but I never understood in this way. This is much more clear, I think. And uh, Polishuk actually used the Bohr resolution in his original paper. Okay, he was done it for a tour. For mm -hmm. tours. You can write it down uh, in more detail. Okay. Mm -hmm. For a torus, the, this is compact and you can uh, have no problem in taking d bar minus one. 
and he said that this is Sego kernel. And there is so-called Fay relation. It's quadratic relation. And Polishuk interpreted this Fay relation as the A infinity relation. But you know, when you discover something, you are not able to explain it properly. So it's a rule that Bourbaki po pointed out that somebody discovers and then Bourbaki put it to another person from Bourbaki who, gave, who, who was giving a talk on it. And they call it asterisks. Where another person explains the idea Second person explains the idea of the first person. So they were really great, okay? Understanding this too. So it's not science, it's meta science. Okay, I think, so you have, you said that there would be a second option, uh, eight minutes break and followed by yes, 30 minutes. Yes, eight minutes or... break and then I'll speak for, is it okay? Or you have to go. Everyone else okay? Is everyone else? Are everyone else okay? It's fine with me. Okay. If there are any physicists around here, I have to say sorry because I'm as I think I'm asking a, a stupid questions and so you see, I see people who enter the seminar and uh, basically well, there are either mathematicians or mathematical physicists, but uh, it is the mathematician's point of view here. But maybe I am asking uh, uh, the things that everyone else is already know. So that's what I'm afraid of. But no, you see. No, no, no. Everything you're saying is very interesting because I'm very interested in, in, in mathematical point of view of the problem. Okay. And anyway, it, turn, it turns out for the best, especially for me, yes, really. It's because, uh, okay, so no, now, now there is a break, okay? okay? And then I'll continue. So I cheated you a bit in small points, actually. But uh, you will, you, so the general idea is, uh, is clear, okay? And people in the Russian mathematical school have the following, okay, I, I cannot stand the, so it's the last conclusion. Suppose you have a manifold. So I think that the modern view of the manifold is a category of, uh, of something like sheaves. Okay? So actually, you forget about the manifold and you start the categories. Okay? Differential graded categories. So you say that differential graded categories are shifts on something, okay? And this something you call manifold. Okay, so you have these categories, but you want at the end to have something like functions. Because in old algebraic geometry, people uh, said that uh, everything is made out of functions, polynomials or rational functions, something, okay? People will say, give me functions, okay? So do you know what they say? Having a differential graded category, you have following things. You have objects, okay? This is the category. And objects have moduli. Mm -hmm. And then you have moduli space of objects, but you still need functions. So to get these functions, you are computing Massé operations. And these Massé operations give you a basis. It's a way how to extract uh, rational functions or the field associ associated to would be manifold. So this is relation between old Grossendieck and other people idea that manifold is something about commutative ring and the modern idea that manifold is about differential graded category of something. 
Okay? And the key point are Massey operations that are these guys. That's how you get functions. Starting getting this, you can reconstruct everything, right? You combine objects, combine morphisms, compute higher Massey. Ah, oh, what you have? You have an old view of manifolds. So that's why this uh, construction is important for novel understanding of what manifold is. So it is the, the translation. Okay? And I consider it uh, very important. Piece of mathematical philosophy. How to get functions from uh, category. Okay. Sorry, five minutes break. It's hard to stop me. I'm sorry. It's okay. When I'm talking, I'm a bit excited. I think it's normal. So five minutes break.
Okay. Maybe now it's time to continue. Mm -hmm. Don? Yep, I'm okay. Okay. So before I'll go to field series, I want to make one more philosophical remark. And uh, now this remark is not about uh, people who are doing algebraic geometry and homological algebra. It's a remark concerning people who are doing differential geometry. So people in differential geometry have a lot of complicated equations, okay? And mostly these equations, for these equations, they only know that uh, they are, uh, that solution exists, okay? But it's impossible to write down this solution in uh, any tractable form. However, sometimes it happens that that solution could be written in terms of understandable functions, like rational functions, trigonometric functions, elliptic functions, tractable functions, okay? And every, and every time, person from differential geometry coming up with such solutions says, hey, I am great. I have this nice solution to system of partial differential equations. And it is explicit. It could be metric somewhere. It could be explicit form of self-dual connection. It could be something else, okay? And everybody applauds him and says, oh, he is great. He can solve this hard problem in differential geometry, and it has an answer. While most of the problems don't have explicit answer. And uh, <clears throat> so there is a reason for it. And I'll try to give you, you I'll try to give you a universal reason why it happens. So there are some problems in differential geometry that could be reformulated as uh, problems in homological algebra, okay? And if problem could be formulated as a problem in homological algebra, we, co we could replace Dalibor resolution or Deram resolution or some kind of soft resolution by resolution with the finitely many terms and with finite dimensional vector spaces. And then we could compute results there. But this is the same result. It's a something like higher operation computed at the simpler resolving. So so-called solvability in differential geometry means that some problems in differential geometry have this interpretation. And others don't have this interpretation. So you don't have a chance to get explicit formulas. So actually, you should write down an inverse process. So it is kind of, so I'm proposing a tool, how to get prizes in differential geometry, okay? You start with problems in uh, algebraic geometry, homological algebra, anywhere where you have uh, good solutions. Then you move to so-called, how do you call it? Smooth resolution, okay? Any type of smooth resolution. Reformulate a problem in that resolution or resolvent. And you know that it, it has a good answer. So you say, yes, I solved the problem. 
in differential geometry. Okay? So it's a trick. You are never solve direct problems. Whenever you have a direct problem, you should forget about it. You always do inverse problems. You have number of uh, solvable cases. You go to resolve ones, and you are getting a result. And then you are selling this as if you are so clever to solve this problem in differential geometry. And people from differential geometry just plug your solution into complicated equations. Compute say, wow, really? Okay. Okay. So after this philosophical remark, on the relation between differential geometry and the uh, homological algebra. Okay. And we have here an example. Let me explain about algebras and so called vertex algebras. Okay. Actually, generalization of the vertex algebras would not be vertex and would not be algebras. But let me say something, okay? So sometimes they look like exactly vertex algebras. You see, vertex is a synonym of a point, okay? So algebra basically we, means that you I think have we lose a focus a little bit, so you have to adjust your camera. Ah, again, it's because when I cleaned it. Yes, when you clean this shape, then it immediately out of focus. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. I have a bad habit to clean the board. Okay. Not focused. Okay. How to teach it to be focused? Let me try this trick. Focused? Yes, yes. It okay. Much okay. So, originally, algebra was about binary operations. On something. With some relations. Okay. So, what is the origin of such operations? And uh, the answer is that the origin is cobody. You write something like this. And then as I explained in the beginning, when you say cobodies, you mean the category. It is symmetric monoidal. Where these are objects. So these two things are, is also an object. And this is uh, what you call a product, okay? So this is an object, this is another object. That is a product of two objects of this type. Good. But then you need to have a morphism. And when you write down a morphism, you assume something like this.
So now there are several ways to study things. One way to study thing is to consider just smooth morphism. However, there is a more tricky way to say that you study morphisms with geometrical data. So you can discuss what geometrical data is, but you may think about this geometrical data as something soft, like metric connection differential forms, something like that. Something that is that could be cut in pieces. Okay, and there is another symmetric monoidal category called category of complexes. Okay, and then. Quantum field theory is this function. So it is quantum field theory. From here to here. Okay. Now, I would like to study at a moment. The geometrical data such that functions. Okay. Okay. How, how to say it? There are several ways to say it. I would like to study. Okay. T1 of geometrical data. Okay. So that functions of geometrical data. Functions here are differential forms on geometrical data. So maybe it's not the best definition. May, uh, so, so here, this depends on differential forms on geometrical data. You may ask why I am considering the run. Maybe I should consider Dalbo. But then it would mean that geometrical data has complex structure. But I'm not trying to give it in the complete generality, you see? So here I propose to have differential forms on geometrical data. It would be enough for me. Maybe you, you could generalize. So the functor applied to cobodies is what? So where does it belong? It belongs to home, say from initial vector space, that is a tensor product of V and in into the final vector space, I will call them V tilde one times V tilde and out times differential forms on G. Okay. You apply functor to cobaltism, you get here. So for each geometrical data, you get something. There is consistency condition saying that when you cut geometrical data decomposes and uh, things should be coherent. So composition of uh, morphism should go into composition of morphisms, okay? There is additional condition. If you play with empty object, it is condition when you 
when you are cutting the handle. It's also a piece of this data. Here you need to have the super trace, of course. So I want to put uh, one more condition here. So here I have a category of complexes. I have differential here. Since I put here differential forms on geometrical data, I have differential here. So what is the only natural condition that I can impose? Of course, condition of total closeness. Okay. So I should write down closed function. And this is what I called higher topological quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is because we have uh, cobaldisms with geometrical data. This geometrical data may be empty, just smooth manifolds. This is quantum field theory. Topological quantum field theory was, a, was an intermediate notion when you had complexes and uh, when you study just functions on geometrical data that are locally constant. And higher topological quantum field theory is when you replace functions by differential forms. And uh, due to general philosophy, the notion of having a closed function or constant function should be replaced by uh, a closed differential form. So it's a way how we generalize. And if you want to generalize even more, you may have here some other complex. Not necessarily Dalbo. There are. You can have here Dalbo, and then you can uh, play with it somehow. Okay. But this would be enough for my purpose. Okay. Because having this, I can define the notion of vertex. So vertex, vertex is something like a point. And if I am here, I don't see here any point. Okay. So now I am erasing things. And when I see this picture, no points. You see, it's interesting. When physicists started to do quantum field theory, they said that the main thing is the axiom of locality. And locality, the word locality, comes from the Greek word locus. And locus was a point. Okay. But here there are no points. By the way, having no points, there are no fields. No points, no fields. But this is a proper definition. So it means that objects like points and fields are not fundamental. They are derived objects. So it always happens. The proper definition of an object is not you think it should be. Okay. So points are derived Let me give you an analogy how I'm thinking about it okay historical analogy Almost 200 years ago people were thinking about in all days
19th century. People were people were thinking about spaces. Okay. So they had an example of a sphere. Okay. And the way how they were thinking about a sphere was something that is embedded in R3. And they had an idea that sphere is the radius vector, okay? That dependent on some coordinates like phi theta angles, okay? So it was the way how they were thinking about it. Then it was clear for them what is the tangent plane, okay? You have a sphere, you have a plane. So this is a tangent plane. Of course, it's a plane in R3. Okay? It's clear. So this was the original definition of the tangent plane. It was very obvious. It was very clear what it is. Okay? But then people... Uh, was thinking a bit and they came to the notion of smooth manifold not embedded in RM. Okay. So they came to this idea, I think, in the 20th century. So before they were thinking of about manifolds or something embedded. But later then they were starting to think about it as, as the object by itself. And then they have to redefine. what the tangent vector is. You see, it still has a notion, it's called a vector, but it's not the plane in RM. There should be a better definition. And people came, as you know, to the following definition. You have a sphere that exists per se as people say in Latin, just a sphere. So they were considering curves gamma of t, such that gamma at zero is the point p, okay? And they say that these are, that these are tangent vectors. They don't look like tangent vectors. But it is the best thing that you can have, actually. What you can do, you can consider that the two curves are equivalent if derivative along the curve at zero is the same. If when you evaluate any functions, so in this approach, they had notion of function. D over dt at t equals zero. So it was a huge equivalence relation that identified many things. So the notion of tangent vector that was clear here became derived here. Okay. Here you can see it. And here you need to study these relations, these equivalence. Okay. So it's interesting that similar things happen with the notion of local observables. So all point of view.
It's called functional integral. You are imagining something like an integral that, of course, does not exist in general. Okay? And you have a problem to define it. And then you imagine, so what is phi? Phi is some matter. So, so since you're not a physicist, I need to tell you that S is something like an action, integral of Lagrangian of phi. What is Lagrangian? Something that depends on finite number of derivatives, okay? I think already mathematician would uh, hate this object. Finite number of derivative, uh, it's an ugly thing. It's not in the philosophy of modern mathematics, but people were thinking this way. Oh, okay, it will be a matter. Because it was easy to see it this way. Because this Lagrangian entered classical mechanics or classical field theory. And then there was an idea of local observable. Oh, local observable. What does it mean? What is it? It is a function of phi, d phi, d to phi, etc. Again, some function of local uh, of Derivatives, a finite number of derivatives. Come on, it's ugly. This is an ugly thing. This is an ugly thing. Okay? But what people understand? People understand that you can deform the Lagrangian with the help of observable. That if you deform Lagrangian, you will get an observable at some point x so x is a point okay point should be called p because it's a point right p belongs to sigma and here i somehow integrate over p in sigma okay don't does this picture make sense to you That if you imagine quantum field theory made out of action, then local observable is something how you are deforming Lagrange. So it seems like that just follows from the expression, right? Yes. You take like if you believe in Lagrange, you just say that here we have Lagrange. Plus, you have the formation of Lagrange. And then you take it down. And you take integral of a sigma out. And you want, so if you want to study the formation of the theory, you have to study local observables. Okay. And if you work with this functional integral approach, you can almost prove the fact, the fact that it's a functor. Do you know how to prove it? You can prove it. It is tropical functor. For sure. What tropical means H equal to zero. So you need to study this exponential integral in the limit H going to zero. And you know what it is. First of all, this integral, integral, functional integral is actually an extremum. So you should take an extra, you should take an extremal thing. And here we have S 
function on extremal trajectory. So for h equal to zero, it's called the classical field theory. I'm sorry, what is the problem actually with Lagrangian having an arbitrary derivatives? Ah, it is non-locality. Good question. Suppose I take a Lagrangian, that is Okay. Having infinitely many derivatives. This is actually something at the, so at point P. This is something at point P plus C. Okay. So if you have infinitely many derivatives. You don't have locality. If you don't have locality, you could not cut. So that's why you should have finitely many derivatives. So you are not going far away from the point P. So having finitely many derivatives means that you are actually sitting at the point P. Uh, yes, I see, but uh, you can just uh, 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 allow arbitrary derivatives, but, but, but finitely many, yes? Uh, it is uh, so basic, uh, so, 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 finite, so finiteness is important here in order uh, to get this uh, locality, and locality you need in order to cut. So main idea is that the action on sigma equals to the action on sigma one plus action on sigma two. This is the key property. And this property we need from to have a functor. It's not that we impose it from our head. It's because we want to have a functor. Uh, yeah, I see. Okay. So this, okay. So this was an old way to treat Factor as, as this integral to treat factor m, of course, is deformation. Okay, I hope that now uh, you try to feel what actually physicists meant. They actually meant. That you have a functor, you are trying to deform it. That's how you get this local observable. And since the represented functor is an integral of the Lagrangian, of course, you have something with a finite number of derivatives. Okay? And this is, this is interpretation due to Feynman. Great Richard Feynman. And this is a and this is what functional integral is all about. Now, when people started to, to do this, they found that it is uh, not well defined. It started to have problems. And people were looking for the better definition. Okay. And finally, they found the better definition. And this better definition, of course, is what I gave to you. But this thing had no uh, 
local observables, no locus at all. So similarly to what I explained to you about uh, tangent vector, but when you are coming to modern definition, fundamental objects that are clear become derived objects, okay? Here you should also derive what you mean by a point. So you have this sigma. So first you need to have a point where you want to derive something. It is like a point where you'd like to start a curve. Take a point. Okay. What can what can you have? Point is not here, but you can have something that is close to the point. A ball. Around the point. So it looks like a point if the ball is small. Now, don't, you see, if you are in the smooth cobodism category, it's hard to define what does it mean to be small. However, if you have some kind of geometrical data, you can define what does it mean to be small. Okay. So if equipped with geometrical data, you know the no, you know the R radius or something that replaces it. Just to give you a feeling that if geometrical data is a metric, you can just work with balls. Okay. And what if geometrical data is the complex structure? You do not have a metric. However, there is the proper replacement. So just imagine that you have a Riemann surface. When you cut out a circle around the point, and you consider it as a boundary, the complex structure of what happens depends on this thing. And this moduli of open of a Riemann surface with additional boundary serves like the size of the ball. Okay. And the people know it from the so-called double construction. That the modular space of Riemann surface with boundaries is, uh, could be explained in terms of uh, modular spaces of uh, the modal surface of the Riemann surface together with the Z2 anti-holomorphic orthomorphism. And, and there you actually have this modular. Okay. So it was my comment about a ball. By the way, if you have more complicated uh, geometrical data, you need to rethink what the ball is. So assume that there is a ball. Then for a given R, you can take a vector 
that belongs to the vector space associated to the sphere. Okay. So this is not a local observable yet. It is kind of approximation. In 19th century, when you had a point, right? You started with what is called a JSON point, P prime. And this pair of points were kind of approximation of the tangent vector but no tangent vector yet. That's why a small ball here is just the notion of neighboring point. So what, you did, what did you do in 19th century for, for smooth manifolds? You want to take P prime to P and consider a limit, right? And you are taking it along this curve. So here we do the similar thing. So I, I'm taking this picture here. You have a set of Bulls that become smaller and smaller. Okay. And then you identify vectors on these boundaries. Or you may not even identify. You may just take the sequence V of R. That's what I prefer. So there is a single definition of local and definition to type profile. They are equivalent, but let us take V of R. That's what I like. And the main object that I called I of Sigma belongs to something something times the vector space that corresponds to the sphere of the radius R. And I can plug this V of R here, okay? And I will call it E sigma paired with V R. And now what I'd like to do, I'd like to take a limit. as r going to zero. And this limit would be defined if this limit exists. I would define this limit as an functor i together with the observable at point p. So actually I have an equivalence classes. So there are some sequences V of R or functions that do not lead to the limit where you have no limit, you need to throw them away. And there are some sequences that have the same limit. You need to factor them out. So equivalence class is a local observable. So I consider this very similar to curves that I here. You identify curves that go together. And here you are identify sequence of vectors. And that's how you get the local observable. Okay? And if I do it this way, I immediately get a bonus. And do you know what is the bonus? The bonus is that I can replace the point P by what? Hmm? I can take a curve instead of one. Kind of manifolds inside it? Yeah. Sorry? Any kind of submanifolds inside this. Any kind of, not, not necessarily even submanifold, 
right. I can take a line and make a tubular neighborhood. I can be even more tricky. I can take a graph. So graph seems singular. However, its tubular neighborhood is regular. I cannot draw it, but it's clear. Tubal so you can consider tubular neighborhood of anything, of whatever you wish. And, uh, and of course I like it because uh, it corresponds to the philosophy that was put uh, in the 20th century. And also it is an ancient philosophy. In ancient Greece, people consider separately points, separately lines, and there was a notion that point is coincident with the line. That line comes through points. In the 19th century, Germans came with this set theory. And they said that line is something that consists of points. Okay. Then Gross and Dick and the company came saying, no, line does not consist of points. Line is a special object. In algebraic geometry, line uh, has a, a radical. So a radical is something that consists of points. Because points are maximal ideals and figures are simple ideals. Or if you allow, uh, allow several figures, figures are ideals. That's it. Okay. So you should consider them on the same footing. Here, something similar happens. In old language, I'd like to start with a point. No democracy. Point was preferred. If I treat things this way, I have the universal notion. All figures are, the, are equal. For each figure, I can construct the notion of observable. So since uh, I follow Grossendick this way, I feel encouraged. Okay. But at the moment, we will start with the vertex algebra. So vertex algebra is uh, when we restrict ourselves to points. But don't, you see, here is a place to generalize. And now let me tell you where the algebra is. Okay. Um, can I ask one question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, it, you said that in a the old way to describe quantum mechanics, the local observables appear as a deformation of a functors, right? Yes. So in this case, this this local observables in this functor formalism, uh, is this functor is the is this functor deformed or something else? The local different? observable is a tool from which we can make the formation of a functor. Oh, I see. So, so when we you have... need to take this local observable mm -hmm. and to integrate it all over the stigma. Of course, it's a question how to integrate. Mm -hmm. Integrate over the point P? Yes, over the point P. I see, I see. So we, we are taking this from the old Lagrangian point of view. However, we are redefining the notion of, of local observable. I forgot to give you an example. And the simplest example, you see, comes in dimension one. In dimension one, sigma is just an interval, okay? So I described it in the lectures, but so here we have two spaces V. 
And here, you, here we have evolution operator. Okay. And moreover, in higher theory, you have this. So this belongs to endomorphism times function on R plus. Differential forms on R plus. Now, the factoriality comes from this cutting. And that's why this is a solution. And this H is called Hamiltonian. So you take plus to product. It's an exponential, right? Now, let us see and the extra geometric geometrical data you're using would length, be like length, length of the I see. Now let us see what is the local observable. I am cutting a one-dimensional ball. I have V V V V. So here. Here I have peculiarity of dimension one, that the boundary of one dimensional ball has two components. It happens only in dimension one. In dimension two, the boundary of the ball has one component. It's a circle. But here it has two components. That's why local observable OP actually belongs to endomorphisms of V. So that's why local observable in D equals to one is an operator. Without any restrictions and conditions. Okay. And if there are operators, I can multiply them. So how do I multiply that? I put them this way. I put them the opposite way. At least I can put them this way. And here I have e to the minus tau h. And I assume that if vector space is finite dimensional and I take p to p prime, I can cut out, I can forget about this interval and uh, it would be just multiplication of operators. So that's how I'm getting that local observable is an operator and uh, what multiplication is, putting them together. Now, let me explain you what the deformation is. Let me forget about DT for a moment. Let us see, what does it mean to make a deformation? I add to H O, okay? And there is a formula that every physicist knows. And mathematician can derive that this is an integral over dt prime e to the t prime H O e to the t 
минус t prime h. So derivative over epsilon of this is this. So this is this idea that the formation is actually an integral of the correlator of local observable. And this is a fact from the linear algebra. You see, you will never call linear algebra physics, right? You just integrate. So how do you integrate? Very simple. It's exponential. You expand, exponential, expand, integrate. Another way to prove it. Consider so-called Schrodinger equation. It solves this equation. Okay. So take derivative with respect to t here. You have derivative as the upper bound, and you have also derivative here. Then you take h down, commute, go, and you will see exactly this formula. So actually, expand in epsilon, and you will see. So take derivative with respect to epsilon, left hand side and right hand side. Okay. So here, here we should get O it is a th plus plus you take the derivative of this. Oh, that's it. So there are many ways to prove this formula. But the meaning of this formula, not the formula itself, is that you're integrating O over the interval. So that's how we are making the formation, by integrating the local observable over the interval. And this is a universal phenomenon. When we want to deform uh, the factor, there are such deformations. Actually, I am cheating a bit because when you are deforming the functor, you can somehow deform the vector space. And that's much trickier thing. And I maybe sometime I'll tell you what I mean by deforming the vector space. But if you have finite dimensional vector space that you are not touching, it has no moduli. How can you deform n dimensional vector space, right? So in a sense that uh, the way you deform, the way I understand what you're saying is that if you deform a differential of your smooth, man, well, let's say deform a complex structure of a complex manifold, then of course the cohomology, the dimension of your cohomology does not change, but uh, the representative should be, you know, changed continuously. So you have to choose a certain, sort, some sort of connection. So here, actually, if I go to the to higher topological, this change would uh, come together with the change of differential. So differential can be changed. Yes. Actually, that's the only way. I... But result would be the same. So I, I was explaining this when I started the course and I considered some examples. Yeah. Okay, so now I have a feeling of what local operator is. And now let me come to the question of vertex algebra. 
So in the re in the restricted sense, the vertex algebra means that you go from local observable to operator. How can you do it? The easiest thing is just to take a cylinder, take a point, put O of P at a point, okay? And that's it. So this thing is an operator because it goes from vector space to vector space. And it also depends on the position of a point. So people call this position, so then it depends uh, on how you are treating it. You already have an algebra. You can multiply things. Because you have a gluing axiom, you can multiply things. So this is a product. It depends on two points. Then you may start equation what happens when two points are coming together. What happens on diagonal? Moreover, having this thing depending on the point you can try to integrate over a circle, if you wish. So that's how you are getting all these algebras. But if you look at it, you can see that there are more structures. You cannot only study this, where there are two points. You can integrate one point around another point. So you can bring two points together, integrate point around another point. So actually, there are more structures than you expect. Moreover, Having this, you can have another thing. Sometimes you have a disk. You can put a point here. And then you'll have this so-called state operator correspondence. So this is kind of an idea that you have behind this vertex algebra. What would be nice to do, consider examples and get mathematical structures that, will, that would allow to compute these guys, okay? Because this is something very formal, okay? So what you may expect? Singularity on diagonal, you don't know what kind of singularity can you have. It is too general. That's why it's better to come to some examples. You see, like in algebraic geometry, what can you say about the general manifold? Nothing. <laughs> so if it's an affine manifold, you can say that uh, there is a ring. What kind of ring? Any ring. So what kind of, ah, so what kind of structure can you have here? I'm sorry. So th there is something that you can say. When P goes to P prime, yes, you, you, you typically have singularity on diagonal. It's the only thing that you can study. And this is called operator product expansion. 
and in different theories you compute it. And uh, sometimes people assume power law. How this, however, this power law is violated in some examples. Well, there are also logarithms. So what? To go further, you need to study examples. Okay, I think it's enough for today. Okay. And uh, next time, I will consider simplest possible example. So, have you seen here in my talk any physics? I'm actually not, but. So, there will be no more physics. <laughs> so, I'll try to explain it to you in mathematical terms. Sometimes I'll call you how physicists are calling this. You see, local observable. Why they call it observable? Because in formulation of quantum mechanics, if this O was Hermitian operator, it was an observable that people observed in experiments. That's why this O was called observable. Okay. So where was, was the physics? Okay. This uh, deformation theory was motivated by Lagrangian. Okay, but it was motivation. So if you accept it, but you should accept it in the tropical way. In the tropical way, you are just taking extremum of local functional. It, is, uh, it comes when you continue your extremal. It's mathematics. It's, uh, it has nothing to do with physics. So I'm sorry, there was a bit of differential geometry. Cobordism here was a smooth manifold. Honestly speaking, this condition could be weakened. So the progress here is uh, to kill differential geometry anywhere you have it. Okay. Interval length is too, too differential geometric. Complex structure. Too much differential geometry. The round differential form. Too much differential geometry. So geometric structures should be replaced by some differential graded algebra or something. Cobordism should be replaced by also something. So that's why this is an intermediate definition. But it's better to work with this with this definition than to wait until some Kansevich or somebody else would give us a final definition. Okay. Okay, questions. Uh, the pictures in the whiteboard, the cylinder and two points. Yes. Uh, is this uh, actually the same thing you draw in the first part of the lecture? Of course. Uh -huh. It is the same cylinder. I see. I see. So basically, so that's how you. Point. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I never thought about it in this way. Thank you. you. See, my role is to give you not, I am not giving you new formulas. I'm trying to give you new views. So if you have different views on the subject, you can get new formulas and new views. So if you take this view, combine it with some other view, you'll get new view because it's progress is evolution of views, not evolution, not when you are multiplying formulas. So it seems like the vertex algebra is really, really should be constructed on a Riemann surface. It seems like, yes, it, it is constructed on the Riemann surface, right? So it is, it is the beginning because you, you should think that dimension two, real dimension two, is not the only dimension that you have. Yes. 
Yes, right. Actually, also, I... in dimension two, you know, in dimension two, there are things like lines, okay? There is a line, and there is observable corresponding to the line, and there is observable corresponding to the point, okay? And there is a notion of linking line pair of points mm -hmm. they're linked mm -hmm. it's also a piece of say correlators or whatever mm -hmm. i told you that it's possible to to get this definition you just cutting this out okay you decouple into pieces but what It's possible to study such thing. You can also grow, draw a graph here, like theta. Theta is the simplest non-trivial graph. It's also observable. And this observable uh, is actually what Edward Witten found in uh, Chan Simons like theory, that you can draw graphs here. Not necessarily loops. Maybe you have heard that Witten became famous for loop invariant. For okay, for uh, not invariant. Okay. So he was studying knots, but not in two dimensions, but in three. But then he realized that uh, it's not only knots that could be studied. You could also study graphs. So you can make a lot of constructions. Some of some of constructions give interesting answers or results. Some of constructions exist, but you are not getting attention. But quantum field theory in this way is a tool how to get all of them. Interesting and not interesting. So sometimes you see, sometimes you get something that uh, other mathematicians consider non-trivial, something that is trivial. Okay, thank you. Okay, so should we continue uh, next Friday at the same time? No. I think it's fine. I think Friday, three p.m. in Beijing is safe. But yes. So so maybe we will have several more seminars, and then we will see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, so we think... can go according to the program. Maybe you will uh, ask several questions, and we could enlarge the program or cut out something. You see, up to yeah, you. Actually, actually, I want to generalize your first examples to higher dimensions. That's. I also want to do this. Yeah. And I have, a, I have, of course, I have ideas how to do this. And uh, maybe the other direction is with what happens if we compactify the cylinder, adding two divisors on uh, at infinities? That is ah. kind of. So, so it would be sphere. It would be sphere. Actually, yeah. the rational thing comes from the sphere. However, oh. However, you are asking very proper question. Of course, we should consider everything all together. And also, it is, it, would be, it is very instructive to tropicalize here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because it simplifies things and phenomena are basically there. Mm -hmm. So you can construct tropical uh, conformal field theories, tropical vertex algebras, if you consider not ordinary geometry, but tropical geometry. And as I explained, in tropical geometry, you have also so-called H-bar expansion. Yes. 
So nobody studied it. As far as I understand. Okay, if you don't mind, I I would want one or two more seminars at the same. Oh, I'm willing to give seminars. You see? Okay. Because I need a listener. <laughs> and you see, you are you are able to guess. You see, I gave you hints. You are solving them like this with this uh, debug. So I hope that we will get more uh, understanding. For me, yeah, absolutely, yes, yes. So, yes, you see, other people are still there. We will so discuss, maybe there's some, some moment they will ask questions, okay? And of course, I want to generalize because I, I'm going around saying, look, Grom of Wheaton theory has to be generalized. This stuff has to be generalized. Dalbo is not only in complex dimension one, you see? <laughs> because before you generalize, you don't understand the structure. So if you do one and two, then you understand something, okay? If you do only one, it's not enough. Algebraic geometry starts when you go from uh, curves to surfaces. You see Dalibor as a differential only if you have complex dimension two. Otherwise, it's cachet Riemann condition. Because in dimension one, all complex structures are integrable. So it's it's not enough to see the depth of what is going on. I, I think you agree, yes? That of course, yes. So, so new phenomena. It could arise at dimension two, and then things probably would go, go more and more complicated. But we should that, make a step from one to two. That's actually a problem. If you, I, I can see that if you pass to complex dimension two, everything becomes somehow invisible. Of course, there is no more, but hard to you know count things by eyes. So. Ah. It, the, and the, you see, to see things by eyes, you have a tropical vision. Yes. <laughs> so, because I can draw K3, I can see K3. This is K3. But as you know, the drawing uh, all possible curves in this tropical picture, tropical K3 is extremely hard, right? I, uh, I tried. Uh, Yes, so here you need to use mathematics. Yes. But 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 you can have a vision of something. You you see here you see K3 and here we see that K3 has uh, it's gonna be yellow. Because it has this sphere and this sphere corresponds to uh, H20 is H2 of real power, okay? So I can see, I can even see a quintic because quintic is another simplex. So this is simplex in dimension three. I can imagine simplex in dimension four, okay? Moreover, I can imagine any simplex. And I understand that simplex, the surface of simplex is a sphere. I can see it. So I like you always say something you can see, something you need to define and, and compute that you cannot see. If you work together, you get two views of the picture. What you can see is geometry. What you can compute and prove is algebra. If you put them together, you have some kind of perspective. Okay. Okay. So let us decide to have next seminar in the same room at the same time. Okay. So who made the recording? So I recorded.
already. Okay. But I saw that someone else is also recording this. Okay, so let, let, let us have two copies. Yeah, thank you for the lectures and. Okay. The... Yes, thanks a lot. I also made a recording, so I will share it. Okay, have. very good. So we have one rec recording in Adria, one recording in Donald. You are you supposed to be in Europe? Yes. Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Well, you are American. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Half. Yes. Okay. So thank okay. you for everyone attending this conference. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye, Steve.